last folks come in, take your seats, and, uh, and let's go. 457 days. That's how old consumer VR is, or let's say the li latest version of consumer VR, the latest VR renaissance, as I like to call it. It's about 15 months. Feels a lot longer for most of us, I guess, right? Um, I think it's a good time, though, to, to take a step back now as uh, the VR is dead articles are becoming more present in the tech press. Um, and to take this time to take a look at the past, the present, the future, um, as cheesy as that may sound. So let's look at the last 15 months, what happened. It was a roller coaster ride, so it's, it's, it's good to stop now and take a little look back. Uh, let's see where we are at now, um, and let's risk a little glimpse into the future. So, as you just heard, um, I'm one of the co-founders, together with my uh, friend David Finsterwalder of Realities IO. And we started with this goal of making real-world places explorable um, that were out of reach before for most people. So one of those places was the Cologne Cathedral. Um, I'm just going to be quickly with the introduction, so um, what we actually do. Um, just to give you an impression, this is from our Death Valley experience. So this is running uh, in Unreal Engine. This is a, a render out of Unreal. Um, we, we sometimes had this problem that people, when we post those videos, they're like, ah, why, why are you posting a video? Like, this is filmed. Um, so for the Cologne Cathedral, we actually did this little uh, video here to visualize what we're actually doing with the mesh lighting up. So this is a complete 3D reconstruction of the Uhrenboden, uh, where the clock sits that drives the clock tower of the Cologne Cathedral that you can explore. It's normally totally off limits for normal tours and tourists and all the people visiting the, the cathedral. And um, so you can see, you can get a feeling of the, of the visual fidelity that, we're uh, that we can achieve by now. Uh, transporting you to those places. Um, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time advertising and, and, and giving the marketing talk uh, today. Um, let's, let's really like go, go a bit through our history and like the VR history um, of, of this latest upcoming of VR in total. And of course, we start with the past. And we start with some wonderful numbers. Who knows those numbers? Who can, who can think what they are? Exactly. Those are the units out there. Five million Gear VR headsets, about 300,000 uh, 300, um, Google Daydream headsets, so left is mobile. There's one million PSVRs in the wild, and 600,000 HTC Vives, 350,000 Rifts. That's no market. And that's something I think we should be totally clear about. This is, this is the start, this is a promising start, this is cool, and this is fun, but this is not a market. 2016 was not the, v, uh, the year of VR. This is, this is like the lower end of the worst case prediction scenarios of what happened. And I found it astonishing how many people were surprised by this. I, for us, you know, coming to our strategy room, this, this was not really surprising, like, yeah, this was kind of like what you expect, you, you, you throw out this new cool tag that has no real content on it, um, and you expect it to, to soar, and people were comparing it to mobile, where the killer app was already out there when mobile came along, you could email, you could go on the internet. We don't have that for VR, so this is to be expected, and I think also a lot of people that are in the core VR community know that, and they are not uh, surprised by those numbers. And I think actually it's a good thing that now we're getting over this, this hype curve and, and like there's a certain disappointment setting in. Because this disappointment, it gives you a little bit of room as a startup working on VR to find out who are you? What are you really doing with VR? What is the value that you're creating? And I think to answer those questions, that takes time. We cannot just like apply the usual mobile uh, startup patterns like go out, uh, go out, put your app out, pay with Facebook ads to get users in, and then just you know like do do the whole growth hacking thing to to scale it up quickly, and then once you find your your engine of growth, just throw more money at it with a seed uh, with a Series A round. 
I think that's, that's just not working. Like, you hit the ceiling really fast. We just saw the numbers. That's, that's the market. So, as I said, like, this is not a bad thing necessarily. Like, this gives us time to experiment with users that are early adopters, and they want to experiment with us. They are, they are there. That's like, they, they love that. They, that's why they're early adopters. They want to see new cool stuff. And you can, you can actually get a lot back if you just ask them and start experimenting with them. When we started, um, we, we, we launched pretty much with the Vive. The night the Vive came out, we were standing in a basement in San Mateo and clicked on like a lounge button. There's a funny video now, uh, Reality uh Facebook page, if you, if you want to check that out. Um, like literally, I was like speaking in the last uh, audio comments the night we launched at 2 a.m. and that's how they sound. If you, if you go to the castle, you can hear that. <laughs> um, and we were totally blown away. Um, about a month in, we were number eight in Steam users. We did not expect that. We hacked something together in four months um, in a basement in San Mateo and, and, and just put it out there to see what happens and, and to, to get a feeling like, is, is it only us who thinks that's cool or is it other people that think that's cool? And that was, that was amazing to, to put that out there and get that feedback. And that's, that's, that was for us the moment where like, okay, we, we seem to tap into something there. Uh, and and we, we should go on. And I think this is like a really good point for the overall state of VR. It's like people are finding those puzzle pieces. We found this puzzle piece of really photorealistic looking places that you can explore that are real places that people can have like form a connection to. And, and it feels like we, we found this puzzle piece and now we have to start iterating, okay, what can we actually do with it? Like, what is the real, real value behind it? Like, it's, it's, we found like a, you know, like a, a gold nugget in, in the stream and now we have to, you know, get all the rocks from it and, and, and chisel out what it really is. And if you, if you look at, like, this is, this is from, uh, from this year, um, the top 20 Steam apps. If you look at those, I think you see a lot of apps that found one puzzle piece. The lab did. They had like those funny introductory things. It's, it's great to show your friends. You know, that's like well, a lot of how a lot of people use VR. They have the VR headset, friends come over, they show that, what you show at the lab, because it's really, you know, like you can shoot the arrows, you have a little bit of photogrammetry, you have a few other fun things. Google Earth is, has been deemed one of the killer apps of VR. I wouldn't go that far, but it's really compelling. It's a really cool data visualization tool. They, they take the super complex geometric data set of the Earth and let you explore it in a really, really nice way, dive into the data, literally. And, and you know, the list goes on. So there's Tiltbrush. Tiltbrush is an amazing tool. They found one puzzle piece. They found this, like, what it means to create in VR and how that is a really, really cool, empowering feeling. And they've been iterating on it. But I think nobody has yet arrived at a point where they built like a crazy, all-encompassing, awesome experience, a killer app or whatever it is. We're still in the stage where like, you know, we're like a bunch of chicken running around and you know, even the blind ones sometimes find like a, a, a nice, nice corn as you probably, it's a, it's a thing that you can't translate from German, but as you guys are mostly German anyway, you know what I mean. So we're, we're finding those, those little bits and pieces lying around. And I think this is a cool, exciting time, and now we have to, start, we have to continue doing that and try to dig deeper and um, experiment with our users. And our users actually... Hmm? Our users actually have spent 12,793 hours on realities exploring. 12,793 hours. And I can tell you, like, our average playtime is tiny compared to some other places. That's actually some of the thing, uh, one of the things that we're working on. But I find this amazing. Just, like, you know, sit down and, and, and take that in. You, you put something out there. We were just, like, three guys starting out, um, basically uh, not knowing what we were doing. And, like, people are actually using this. People are, are giving us feedback. And that is the valuable thing. Like, we're getting all this feedback. We're co-creating with them. We're trying out new things. Now, nowadays, we're trying to move a lot more into, you know, providing more of a story, more of a background um, to the places that we capture and bring in there, like we did with, with the WDR for the Cologne Cathedral. We're also moving more into, into other ways of, of getting, getting additional content in there that, that fosters that, because that's some of the things we learned. Like we, we learned people spend more time in a place when there's more to find, when there's more to do. So let's talk about the present. Where are we now? 
2017 is not going to be the year of VR either. So just to get that out of the way. Who's making money? I guess a lot of you people are making money. That's one of the big parts. B2B is a good place to be right now because there's a still a VR hype. There's a lot of people who want to get you know, VR marketing kind of stuff, looking into business solutions for VR. And they're ready to pay. They are big companies. They, they get the feeling there's something going there. So that's definitely one place to, to make money. So, but looking at the consumer market, I compiled this chart here. Um, and there's a bit of a funny story behind it. So those are the 100 top grossing games from uh, VR games from Steam. I use Steam Spy to get those numbers, so take them with a grain of salt. Steam Spy uses public, um, public profiles to estimate sales um, and, and ownership of games. So numbers are not really correct, but it gives you definitely an impression. Um, and I check you know, with a lot of VR devs that I know, and this, this is something that is really close to their reality. Um, so looking at that, the top uh, grossing apps are actually Job Simulator, Tilt Brush, Raw Data, Arizona Sunshine, and Virtual Desktop. Those are the top five. For Job Simulator and Tilt Brush, the numbers are actually not correct because they were bundled with the, with the Vive when they came out, so you actually have to, that's not what they made in sales. Um, but I mean, look at, look at the, the, the steep decline. At number 58, you're already up four below $100,000. And that's like a one person team working for one year. That's where the cutoff is kind of. So only the 58 top grossing games on Steam, if you assume one person team working on it for one year, makes sense. And that's, that's just a reality that a lot of people don't talk about. And there's, there's a big discussion going in in the, in the indie developer community also about this, how VR is just a really, really tough place to be right now. Yeah, there are a few people like Audio Shield or Space Pirate Trainer where a single or like a small team made a really good deal. But it's a gamble. It's very few. Um, and I, I actually uh, I tweeted that picture yesterday. And it was, I think, I, I never got that many retweets and comments on a picture. So it really seemed to, to trigger like a nerve point in the community. And uh, I got pretty much every, every, uh, every kind of reaction from, wow, this is really interesting, to like, wow, those are great numbers. That's actually really good, to, oh my god, how can you like just throw around fake numbers like that? So it, it seems to be a really sensitive pop, uh, topic. But today, there's 1,888 games on Steam. That's Steam only, not Oculus Home on top. Um, I checked that, that's two, two days ago, so probably by now we're over 1,900, I guess. That's a, that's a pretty tough competition out there for a tiny market like that. So B2C is a tough spot to be. Um, that's, that's 2017. That's what 2017 looks like for most VR startups, indie developers, and content creators. It's about surviving. We talked about you know, like how you can take this time, this early time, to, to learn and to get to know your user and to you know, develop what you're creating and find out what it really is. But that's the prerequisite for it. You have to survive. We are in the comfortable position um, that we got funded and uh, you know, can, can afford working like that, trying things out. But that's not for everybody. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough time right now, and I think we'll, we'll we'll see the consequences of that. So I think our main takeaways from this are it's really, really important to keep your team lean. It's not the time to scale up, to you know, grow a massive team and just like fly, because you can't fly. Another thing that we started to do is to look at, you know, there's, there's no, no high volume, low margin deals possible because the market is not there, so let's look at some of the low volume, high margin deals. So we, we have like some things in the pipeline that might go in that direction, but we always try to not compromise too much on our vision to build a platform for photogrammetry content that people can come to to experience that kind of stuff. So we don't want to do, do too much project work or anything like that. And it's a good time to build your brand because now there's not much out there. I mean, there is, but a lot of it is not that good. So this is a really good time to, to present yourself as a brand um, and get the attention. 
So, future, let's look into the crystal ball. This is one of the things that you should never do because, you know, predictions always fail, but it's fun to do it anyway, so let's go. So, I see death and rebirth. I see the arrival of a new Messiah. And I see many becoming one. That's okay, right? I can leave that like that. You happy? No. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Let's flesh it out a little bit. We got uh, four more minutes. So, um, death and rebirth. There's been a lot of overrace. A lot of startups, uh, especially in the Valley, they raise too much money at too high evaluations. Now they're stuck there. They don't have the user base to get a Series A for that evaluation. They will die. Uh, that started already. Um, we'll see like a lot of weird kind of pivots and stuff like that. I think, Michael, you're going to talk about pivoting later, right? Um, and, but I think we're going to see also a lot of acqui-hires. Facebook, Google, Apple. They're all going to, you know, snatch up the good teams that might have not had so much luck with the market, um, and they're going to start building stuff within those bigger companies. Um, I think you, we already started seeing that. Google has been very aggressive on that front. They hired Alchemy Labs, the guys who built Job Simulator, who actually kind of made money, but I mean, they, they also had a big team, so a million in revenue for a game is it's not that much if you have a big team and work on a welfare title. Um, they acquired Tiltbrush early on, they acquired Soundstage. So they've really been going for like the really good, um, for, the piece, uh, for the people that found a puzzle piece. They've been snatching those guys up to work on Google products. Um, the arrival of the new messiah. What do I mean by that? There's something really interesting coming up. The first standalone headset was announced that is kind of a mobile headset, so it's not tethered to a computer, but it also has positional tracking. I think that's going to be a major step forward and it's going to unlock a new, new, a new user segment. Why? Because you don't have to deal with all the hassle of setting up and having a gaming computer and you know, dealing with all that stuff. Um, and spending all the money, but it's going to be a really hassle-free experience. You just put on the headset, you have the tracking, it's all working out of the box. So that's, that's already for people, you know, that, that may not be early adopters anymore. But beyond that, still giving you proper VR and not just like 360, I can rotate my head, but I cannot move around. So that's going to be really, really interesting, and um, I'm curious what comes up on that end um, this winter. Uh, when HTC and Google bring out their first um, standalone headsets. For anybody who's developing for VR, seeing that happening, I think the most important thing for you to do right now is lock your specs. Because I assume that Oculus will follow up with a standalone headset very soon, and they're going to have, have it run all the content that they already have, because it has the minimum specs that they require for their experiences right now. So you probably can like jump right onto like a new platform if you just lock your specs now. So, many becoming one. What does that mean? So that's, that's the long shot. Um, but I think that's something really important to understand. I think AR, VR, and whatever are the marketing people come up with, they all gonna merge into one thing. It's all gonna be spatial computing. Because AR and VR is, is, is separate right now because of technical constraints. It's just because we can't build one set of goggles that does everything and looks nice and is comfortable to wear and cheap. But that's all engineering problems. What we really want and what entices us about AR and VR is that we you know, can interact spatially in a natural way with digital content. And as soon as those barriers fall away, that's all going to merge into one. And I think that is going to be the point where this really, really takes off and becomes, you know, like another mobile kind of thing. Because then it's going to be so useful that there's no reason for people to not get one of those things. So that's it for my predictions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Uh, and find me around for questions if you had any. Thanks. <laughs>